Quaker Oak has announced a new name for its Auntie Mama products in response to criticism that was levied at the brand for featuring a racist stereotype of a black woman. The name Auntie Mama and the picture of a black woman shown on the packaging based on a former slave named Nancy Green will be replaced with the name Pearl Milling Company in what appears to be a picture of the 19th century water mill CNN reports. The Pearl Milling Company was the late 19th century business that created the originally ready-made pancake mix. Now, according to PepsiCo, it was founded in, in 1888 by Chris L. Root. Root named the original company after Old Aunt Your Mama, an 1875 song from a minstrel show that featured performers in blackface who wore aprons and bandana headbands. PepsiCo said it conducted extensive market research to come up with its new brand name. The new brand is expected to launch in June. So the names change, it serves the same. Does that really matter to the people? Because from what I'm hearing during the pandemic and the fact that a lot of people had to eat at home and stayed at home, that their numbers were great. So I don't think it affect them as a company in the long run. But I think this was needed to be done. Because it was racist. Yeah, well, yeah, but it's, <laughs> like it's, but it's racist. been racist for years. But now with the, I guess it came to the ugly head with the whole Black Lives Matter. I mean, yeah, th it's so sad that, like, this is our life, that there are so many racist, like, blatantly racist symbols around us that have been normalized, as this is just how it is. The syrup you eat has to shame you. Like, this is, and I know, like, people are like, oh, you know, I they feel like they loved the branding and this, this, right. and that. Not every black person is against this. We're not a monolith. But it was stupid. It was racist. It was ridiculous. It was awful. And they weren't even paying that woman, that woman's family, her estate. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, well, this now is... Now, that's, yeah, the business side, that's a oh, problem. ridiculous. Also, Pearl Milling Company sounds a little antebellum, too, but I mean, I guess. Yeah, I'm not yeah. happy with that name. I, don't really know. I just think well, we've got to get away from normalizing racist stuff. No, I absolutely agree that uh, it was very racist, and I'm glad that they changed the name. But this just reminds me, you guys know I always talk about Chicago. This reminds me, first of all, I can't see myself going into a store and being like, oh, can you get some uh, Pearl Milling Coats uh, <laughs> syrup or pancakes? Like, it just, it's not even that great of a name. But this just reminds me of like how in Chicago, um, the, the Sears Tower was renamed to the Willis Tower, but real Chicagoans still call it the Sears Tower. So I feel like we're still going to be like, I need some Aunt Jemima. Like, People I think we're going to call Aunt Jemima. Exactly. Like, like, I think so. we're, we're still going to call it that. All right, Wells Fargo now announced equity investments in six African-American minority depository institutions as part of its March 10th, 2020, pledged to invest up to $50 million in black-owned banks. As part of the capital investment, the banks will have access to a dedicated Wells Fargo relationship team that will provide financial, technological, and product development expertise in order to help each, each institution grow and benefit their local community. These investments are designed to help the banks become stronger and more impactful to the minority communities they serve, which leads to economic revitalization and job opportunities, said Bill Daly, vice chairman of public affairs at Wells Fargo. The recent announcement includes investments in following institutions. So, the Broadway Federal Bank in Los Angeles, Carver Federal Savings Bank in New York, Citizens Savings Bank and Trust in Nashville, Commonwealth National Bank, also m &F Bank in Durham, North Carolina, and Optus Bank in Columbia, South Carolina. So this made me a proud Wells Fargo customer, okay? Like, this made me a very, uh, very proud <laughs> Wells Fargo customer. But, see, you know, what I was thinking about was, I don't know if you guys remember last year, uh, the CEO made that comment about there's not a lot of uh, black job, there's not a lot of black talent, talent yeah. in right in the pool for Wells Fargo. So I feel like this was a, even though a year, it's almost been a year, I feel like this was a year-long idea to figure out how can we get, they, they ended the year with bad press, so they kicked off the new year with a budget. So not only did they do this, you guys, they also added two, $25 million to small businesses for black people. I mean, they added a lot of, they also, $255 million, excuse me, for nonprofits. Also, they added a $500,000 grant for Iowa Company. I mean, they kicked off this year, like, we need to be on the right side of history. So, cheers to you, Wells yeah. Fargo. And I love they it. they said they want to do it during Black History Month. They definitely did that. Yep. And uh, they're all about closing the racial wealth gap. So, we applaud them for wanting to do that. And they also have a few organizations that help serve on an average over 60% mm. people of color. So, we love what you're doing now. Now let's get more of us inside of Wells Fargo as employees. Let's and if that. hey, and if and if you guys want to just drop a million dollars into my bank account, I'll totally be fine with that too. <laughs> that part. <laughs> All right, Uber will soon offer free rides to Walgreens clinics to help people in underserved communities get a COVID-19 vaccine. The program is aimed at those who live in socially vulnerable areas and may not be able to easily make it to a pharmacy or clinic. Once you have confirmation of a Walgreens vaccine appointment, you'll get an email inviting you to book a free ride if you're eligible for one.
Pilot transit programs will get underway in cities including Chicago, Houston, and El Paso, Texas, as the supply of vaccines ramps up. The program in Atlanta could start as soon as next week. Now, we're told almost four-fifths of U.S. residents live within five miles of a Walgreens pharmacy, and the company has opened mobile and off-site clinics to bolster vaccine deliveries. More than 70 percent of the company's COVID-19 testing sites are in socially vulnerable communities. Uber's transit pledge is part of a commitment it made in December to provide up to 10 million free rides or discounted rides to help people get vaccinated. So obviously this helps Uber because the more we get a hold of this, right, the better it is for people hopping in their cars using their service. But, you know, we have been talking so much, and I think media as a whole, been talking so much about the distrust, right, in the black community when it comes to vaccines. But there haven't been enough stories about actual effort being done to get more black people vaccinated, to get more black people the information and the education. Here in L.A., I don't know if you all know, Monday at Dodger Stadium, there were mm. thousands of vaccine appointments available. Mm. And that just made me think about they said it was a, a miscommunication with messaging, but that just made me think about like thinking about like if my grandmother was still alive, I don't think she'd be able to get on the computer and get um, no, she wouldn't get an appointment herself. Right. Somebody exactly. would have had to help her. And mm -hmm. what if there are grandmothers who don't have somebody to help them yeah, you're right. in uh, our community? Yeah. Jay Dell, the producer of the morning show here that I do, um, he took his mom. Uh, today, matter of fact, to get uh -huh. her first shot. He was excited about that, but he had to go online and do all that information for her because sometimes they just don't know. A friend of mine would suggest, you know how they have the, the blood mobile trucks that we use to go to neighborhoods? Maybe they could even do that to go to certain neighborhoods and have them take care of them right outside their home. So maybe that's a possibility as well. Well, you know, I always like to think about um, entrepreneurship when it comes to something like this because, you know, Uber saw a loss of $6.8 billion in 2020 um, because, you know, although uh, food deliveries are going up like Uber Eats and things like that, Postmates, the actual ride share part of Uber has been going down. People have not been driving in cars. So this was so smart, in my personal opinion. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, we're not getting rides. How do we find a way to make people think of us first over other ride share companies? So I was like, yeah. they partner with the in-demand company, like Walgreens. People have to go to Walgreens for their medications and things like that. And then also vaccines, which is very important right now. So I was like, okay, Uber, you, you're smart. So now the next time we think about, you know, where do we want to, you know, what company we want to use for ride share, Uber's going to be the first one. So I thought yeah. that was really smart of them. That's true. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez teamed up in New York Monday to introduce a $2 billion in special FEMA funds for families who have not been able to afford proper funerals for their loved ones who passed away as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. The New York Democrats announced that families can get reimbursed up to $7,000 for funeral expenses with $260 million of those funds to be directly allocated to New Yorkers. Eligibility for the funds will be retroactive through the beginning of the pandemic, January 20th, 2020 to December 31st, 2020. And Schumer says he and Ocasio-Cortez are working to keep the program in place for the rest of the pandemic. This funding is strictly targeted to families who have lost a loved one as a result of COVID-19. Those applying for the funding will need to provide various forms of documentations, such as receipts and invo invoices that need reimbursement from funeral costs and the death certificate. Uh, this one hits home so hard, and I'm going to tell you why, because I've had family, have family members and friends that have passed away. Same. And look, families are not ready for this. They no. weren't prepared yeah. for this. And sometimes they have to sign off to the state for the state to uh, either cremate or bury them for them. A lot of cases, they're not even able to see their loved ones when they're laid to rest. So I think it's so important because you think about mentally, how we're affected by this financially as well. Mm -hmm. Another way that people have been financially affected by the pandemic, another way that, you know, even if you can scrape it up, families are financially ruined Yes. after this. It's hard to recover from that. Yeah. It really is. Well, I think this is amazing, um, but I also feel like other states should have this as well. Like, you know, great job to New York, but I feel like other states and cities, whatever, wherever in the world, should also find this as something that could be great for families. Like you said, Romeo, I have family members that as well that passed away from COVID-19. Money was an issue, uh, you know, distance was an issue, COVID-19 was an issue. So I hope other places and other states pick this up as well. Definitely. All right, now moving right along, for pre former President Barack Obama took to Twitter Tuesday to urge Americans, especially black Americans, to get the coronavirus vaccine as early as they are eligible. Mr. Obama addressed misinformation about the vaccine and asked Americans to trust the science behind the drugs. There is a lot of disinformation out there, but here's the truth. You should get a COVID vaccine as soon as you are available to get it. It could save your life or a loved one's life, Mr. Obama wrote in the tweet. His tweet included a link to a New York Times opinion piece that included 60 black health 
experts that are warning Americans about vaccine disinformation and the importance of the drugs in the fight against the coronavirus. Always love when Barack Obama steps into the chat because, you know, we always talk about, um, you know, uh, Barack Obama and we were talking about uh, the other presidents that were in, in, influencing us to get the vaccine. And, um, you know, I think this is great that Barack Obama is doing that. But um, the uh, WHO organization, um, global, uh, who, sorry, they recommended um, this new vaccine, you guys. I just I wasn't sure if you guys heard about it, um, called the Oxford Astrina Zeneca. I might be saying it, but it's a COVID-19 vaccine, and it's recommended for people age 65 and older. So there's a new vaccine that's entering into the world right now, and they're saying that it's specialized for people 65 years and older. So I'm hoping that we can hear more about that as time goes on. Well, when Obama talks, people listen. They so, do. I mean, that's why they got him on the forefront of this. And we're dying at a higher rate than anyone else. So if you do want to get vaccinated, you should definitely line up for that. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So now speaking of vaccines, uh, someone in our YouTube chat just said, uh, nope, I'm not getting a vaccine shot. Too many side effects. All right. One of our other soulmates says the criminal justice system only gives justice for their criminals. Hmm, that was a good one. Another one says, see, this is ridiculous. How is he not fired? I mean, so many good comments coming in the chat. Keep them coming. We're going to be pulling them out and putting them on the live show.